Um, if you have any questions or concerns, please see Josh Junkin over here. We've also got uh, the sheets back there for, so you can apply. Um, fancy. <laughs> Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce our, actually, our first David Sanjak keynote in popular music um, here at the Society for Ethnomusicology. We, it used to just be called the Popular Music Section Keynote Chair, and, we've, and um, we're very grateful to our section and to the Society for um, aiding us in renaming it after David Sanjak. So we're very honored to have Greg Tate, uh, who founded the Black Rock Coalition, or co-founded the Black Rock Coalition, wrote for a very long time for Village Voice, um, is an incredible musician. If you've never seen Burnt Sugar um, in your town, go see them next time they're there because they're amazing. Um, he's also is a crazy fancy publisher, uh, which he'll deny. Um, and his, so much so that his book, <laughs> Flyboy and the Buttermilk, Essays of Contemporary America, is going to be published, uh, republished at Duke. In fact, he was just hassled today by his editor. <laughs> And everything but the burden, what white people are taking from black culture, Midnight Lighting, Jimi Hendrix and the Black Experience, Fly Boy 2, um, even the Greg Tate Reader. Um, so this is, this is Greg Tate. Hello. So how long, too long? So, um, yeah, this, this, this paper is just way too long, so. I'm just gonna barrel through it. Feel free to nod out, blank out, check out, space out, just take it out. Um, and we'll come out on the other side. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just get louder at the end. You know, oh, okay, it's, it's, finally, it's finally done. You know. um, so um, I, I was told I had about 40 minutes tonight, so obviously I'm not gonna be brief. Um, but, you know, like uh, telling a, a long-winded ex-music, Village Voice music journalist that you have 40 minutes, it's like telling me I have 40 pages, you know, or, you know, 40,000 words. Um, um, so, I'm not gonna be brief, I'm gonna try to be uh, repertorially sound and where possible expansive, if not especially revelatory about uh, information I'll assume this body of serious thinkers already has. Um, I wanna take uh, some of my beginning cues from Brother Malcolm, who once began by saying, let's get right down to earth and speak in a language everyone here will clearly understand. I want to echo Martin Luther King uh, when he spoke of uh, seeing dark days ahead. Um, as we and those in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, wait for the other judicial jackboot to fall in the movement towards justice for Big Mike, uh, Mike Brown, shot down by Officer Darren Wilson on all night of this year, setting off one of the largest, longest sustained mass mobilized protests against police brutality and uh, the U.S. criminal injustice system of this era. Um, but before we address that movement and the self-silencing um, that I believe it has provoked among a fearful few of today's black cultural elite, celebrity elite, media elite, uh, I want to address this question this long-standing dance between the tradition of black music and black grassroots political activism. Uh, of this tradition, Amir Baraka once wrote an epic poem called In the Tradition, where he told us these two dynamic markers of blackness in America, music and protest, have always been coterminous, commingling, uh, they would say coagulating. Uh, in that poem, Baraka asked the musical question, what is this tradition based on? Uh, my own relationship to this tradition uh, is based in um, my now 83-year-old lifetime activist mother, Mama Tate, who's been keeping it real and keeping her faithful flock on Facebook on point for about five years now. Um, and because I was raised in uh, what we call a movement household, I was raised, raised in the church of uh, cultural nationalism. And uh, in that church, I was raised to believe black sound sound reasoning was a political instrument, a political weapon. So this tradition was also um, comprised of not just music, but testimonial, confession, sermonizing, catching the spirit, um, and what uh, Rasta calls word sound power. And because I was raised by a mother who believed in keeping word sound power, 
heavyweights and heavy rotation in the home. I was raised in a movement house where Malcolm X's message to the grassroots and his ballot to the bullets uh, routinely shared stereo time with Nina Simone's Mississippi God Band with his respect, Redding sitting on the dock of the bay and Pete Seeger's greatest hits, his Juan Tanamara being a particular favorite for my younger self. It was also in Mama Tate's movement household that I first discovered Lenny Bruce, John and Alice Coltrane's College of Music, Ornette Coleman's Crisis, and a 45 RPM copy of Minister Louis Farrakhan's cult single, A White Man's Heaven is a Black Man's Hell, released when the minister was still known as the uh, violin playing calypso singer, Louis Tuings. Uh, the Folkways album featuring Bernice Reagan and the Snick Fri Freedom Riders, uh, flipping old spirituals into desegregation soundtracks, Rallying Cries was also in the mix. Uh, as you can see, Mama Tate got her bid in early. Uh, growing up in a movement household also meant you were listening to reggae via the Harder They Come soundtrack years before the rest of black America decided they might like this Bob Marley guy. And ditto the African lady addressed in Fela Kute's refrain. Uh, the movement claimed diasporic musical blackness wherever it could be heard fighting for power. It also meant um, that we got to see James Brown perform Say It Loud on what J.B. Sideman and Fred Wesley now calls the Afros and Denim Jackets Tour in 1969, and ditto seeing Nina Simone swell us up with Young, Gifted, and Black in 1972. Uh, Mama Tate was also responsible for us learning to love the anti-apartheid anti freedom pop of South Africa by Hugh Master Kayla, Leda Mbulu, and her friend Mary Makiba, before Makiba married Mama Tate's equally beloved comrade, Stokely Carmichael. She also got a smooth transi transition from civil rights into the multidisciplinary black arts movement, uh, which begged us to dig that all black being was reflective of a poetic, uh, wherein all black art practices were in a critical counter supremacist com conversation with Europe's traditions of art making. Uh, growing up in, uh, and self making too, uh, growing up in a movement household in the 60s, Dayton, Ohio, also meant inheriting your older sister's collection of 45s when she went off to Howard University for college and joined the student movement there, which took over the A building in 1968 and helped precipitate all those university programs we now call Black Studies, Africana Studies, and Jazz Studies too. Like the rest of freedom writing, uh, of her freedom writing generation, Big Sis loved James Brown and the Motown of Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, and David Ruffin. That was the rah-rah soundtrack to her generation's record. My Sharita Moore, Fingertips, Parts 1 and 2, Ooh Baby, Baby, Going to a Go-Go, Jimmy Ruffin, What Becomes of the Broken Heart, it jumped out of that stack of 45s and took you to the bush too. As did the Marvelettes, uh, Wait a Minute, Mr. Postman, and Martha Reeves and the Vandellas Dancing in the Street. Later on, Amir Baraka made us understand that 1964's Dancing in the Street was a coded message telling the people to get ready to rumble. Sure enough, Watts, the Watts Intifada kicked off in 65, Detroit's in 67. Uh, in this pivotal 67 essay, Rhythm and Blues and the Changing Same, R&B and the New Black Music, which prophetically called for a unity music that bridged New Soul and the New Black Jazz. Um, Baraka also predicted the 70s James Brown and uh, Earth, Wind and Fire and Mandrill and Dayton's own Ohio Players and of course, Parliament Funkadelic and War and so forth and so on. Um, but in that same stack of uh, 45s, we found Curtis Mayfield, Curtis, Curtis Mayfield's gentle, plaintive voice that uh, seemed, to always be walk, seemed to always walk side by side with us in those days. Uh, Curtis urging us to not only be bedazzled by the gypsy woman, but to dig that we're a winner and to keep on pushing and moving on up and employing the high yellow gal to recognize that she was just the surface of our deep, dark well. Uh, but the first music that your reporter truly called his own, though, was that of the psychedelic temptations, Norman Whitfield and Dennis Edwards' temptations. Temptations of psychedelic shack, cloud nine, can't get next to you, smiling faces, and most definitely the extended nine minute album version of Runaway Child, which provided our first exposure to musique concrète and cinema, cinematic sirens in a pop song, thus setting the stage and precedent for Chuck D, Hank Shockley, and Eric Saddle, and Public Enemy Bomb Squad. It was in the Dayton, Ohio Public Library that we first discovered Amir Baraka's Black Music, a tone which preached the gospel of a newer, freer freedom swing, and dared suggest James Brown's screams were more radical though, than those of Ornette Coleman. In Black Music, uh, Baraka also deconstructed the power and balance between jazz and the white critic, 
and that say that undeniably led me to be sitting here before you today. Um, in the 70s, Tate family moved from Dayton to D.C. to Chocolate City, where radio wasn't just pitched between soul, country, and top 40 stations as in the Midwest. It was in D.C. that we discovered WHUR FM 96.3 and what is still the most revolutionary format imaginable, 360 degrees of total blackness. <laughs> Uh, now, I'm prone to describe uh, 70s DC as a black cultural utopia, and WHR's 360 degree black format was uh, for a time a big part of why. Not to mention how the university's film department and its raging black independent cinema raging bull, Haile Jarima, and the fine art departments then under the sway of long tall Jeff Donaldson and his comrades in the Afro Cobra pain movement out of Chicago. Uh, public Television was also on some different stuff back then. There was Tony Brown's Black Journal and genius producer Ellis Hayslip's Soul, which set the stage for Don Cornelius' Soul Train, but featured an even hipper uh, polyglot mix of newer and older black music, Rasan Lowen Kirk, Taj Mahal, Odetta, and the national, ta national TV debuts of such spanking new things as Mandrill, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and the Rance Allen Group. Soul devoted whole hours to live sets by Stevie Wonder, Billy Preston, Al Green, and Herbie Hancock's M. Wandisha Band. WHUR's 360 degrees of total blackness meant Gil Scott Heron's the revolution, and the revolution will not be televised, and the last poets, niggas are scared of revolution, got dropped on your head in the same program block as Muddy Waters' Hoochie Coochie Man, Sunrise Faces the Place, Ella Fitzgerald's Lullaby at Birdland, the Honeycombs broadcasting how they were gonna put it in the one ads, uh, all slated opposite the Melodians' River of Babylon, Coltrane's Love Supreme played back to back with the Barcades, Black Rock, Rufus and Chaka Khan's Tell Me Something Good slip and slide into Hancock's Ostinato for Angela Davis and LaBelle's Lady Marmalade. Even the early HUR DJs had on air handles reflective of that era's heavy Afrocentric frontier. <clears throat> One brother called himself and his show Black Fire. Another sister in her broadcast became known as his Ebony Moon. This was the same era when the Art Ensemble of Chicago flew their own handcrafted banner for 360 degrees of total blackness, describing their polyglot panorama of Pan-African music as that of an all-encompassing great black music, ancient into the future. Uh, living in 70s DC also meant that when you went out to hear live music, the bills were as mixed up as, as HUR's radio. This was the era where Bobby Womack, Mandrill, and Last Poet shared the Howard Theater stage with Malo, led by Carlos Santana's brother Jorge, and where Al Jarreau, Betty Davis, and Graham Central Station mixed it up on the stage of Howard University's Crampton Auditorium. I told uh, Questlove of the Roots about this, and he just looked at me and said, the same people came to see all that music? I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was incredulous. Um, in the same era, Billy Cobham toured with Parliament Funkadelic, Weather Report opened for the Pan-African Bush Rock of Osibisai, and Chick Corea's Return to Forever headlined for some little known cast from Jamaica known as Bob Marley and the Wellies, a show which in turn served to begat the roster conversion of DC punk hardcore legends to Bad Brains. Civil rights and black power movements transitioned into Free Angel and African Liberation Day movies in 70s DC. Popular and semi popular musicians followed. The movement to support Angela Davis provoked Kirby Hancock's uh, aforementioned ostinato for Angela. Santana's cover by Yete Todd Cochran's Free Angela, and um, the Tribe's uh, song Angela, Angela's Dilemma. The anti-colonial struggle in South Africa prompted Miles Davis to name two of equally ferocious 30-minute tracks in honor of the anti-colonial wars then going on in Southern Africa. Calypso for Lima, Miles' is homage to the Freedom Fighters organization then waging the war against the Portuguese in Mozambique, and the two in Zimbabwe off his album Pangaea in honor of the war against the vestigial British Empire then going on there. The album Get Up With It also provided Miles' take on the prospect of Nixon in China by a 12 bar swing number called Red China Blues. Uh, in, these titular, in, this, in these titular recognitions of Pan-African consciousness, raising Miles was joining the tradition in jazz that stretched as far back as the minstrel Don Divas, Burke Williams, and George Walker shows in Dahomey and Abyssinia. Uh, a trend continued by Duke Ellington with such compositions as his 1928 Hot and Top and the Juan Tizo song he made famous, Caravan, Caravan, not to mention Duke's Arabian Lover and Jungle Jamboree. In 1928, Ellington also recorded a number called Black Beauty, 
uh, a tribute to Florence Mills, uh, Florence Mills uh, a title that was boldly before anybody with Marcus Garvey was considering those two words anything but an oxymoron. Uh, this tradition was based on Edmund Kennedy Ellington too. Not to mention Dizzy Gillespie and Frank Paparelli's uh, 1942 Night in Tunisia, Horace Silver's Cape Verde and Blues, Sonny Rollins' 1954 Origin for Nigeria, Jackie McLean's 1960 appointment in Ghana, and his Fidel as well, uh, Max Roach's Tears for Johannesburg, and his man from South Africa, Randy Weston's Uhuru Africa, and later on Weston would give us um, his Night in Medina as well. Uh, the drummer Tony Williams once said he felt like he had had his civil rights movement in the 1950s watching Miles and Mingus handle their business like, Miles, Max, and Mingus handle their business like stand up no BS dudes in the 50s. Duke Dexter Gordon once told me he considered his bebop generation to be the forerunners of the civil rights movement. So let's make it plain and acknowledge this tradition of singing and fighting was based on Mary Lou Williams, Billie Holiday, Charlie Parker, Sarah Vaughan, and Thelonious Monk too. Let's further acknowledge that by 1928, 1942, 1954, 1960, successive generations of progressive improvisers had already leaped ahead to the African liberation beachhead. And we also must give credit, of course, to Sun Ra and his Nubians of Plutonia, which uh, includes his, his, his songs Watusa, Nubia, and I, Ethiopia. Uh, if you musically came of age in the young, gifted, and black 70s, you listened to the most radical jazz and R&B of that era, and you couldn't help not be radicalized by the conceptual range and autonomy of those music and, and the self-determined aesthetics of those musicians. In the 70s, we swarmed on Skynet, power grabbed all means of media production and media seduction. That power which Huey Newton and the Black Panthers told us to seize now appeared firmly in grasp. Firmly in grasp, it firmly in grasp, at least on the radio and concert stage. Uh, the moment's musical high bar, established by Stevie Wonder's talking book, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, Curtis Mayfield's Curtis, Aretha Franklin's Young, Gifted, and Black, all assured that mainstream R&B wouldn't come half-stepping into the air of black flower power, um, which also brought us Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff's uh, Philly International, um, and Teddy Fendergrass's uh, Booming Wake Up Everybody, Eddie LaVert well and about back established in the age of COINTELPRO, and the Eagles of Money, Money, Money. Um, Curtis Mayfield, again, deglamorizing de pimps and co-dealers in the takedown score he composed for Superfly. Uh, the Superfly flick that made those uh, lumping into ghetto heroes. The era was, in fact, distinguished by a slew of conscious R&B movie themes that have proven exponentially more memorable and enduring than, than the films they carry. Uh, Isaac Hayes' The Shaft, Marvin's Trouble Man, Earth, Wind & Fires, That's the Way of the World, James Brown's Big Payback, uh, Willie Hutch's Brothers Gonna Work It Out, um, for the Mac. Um, Gangster-wise ghetto centricity as we know it from modern hip hop begins with those films and their scores. Uh, no revelation there given hip hop's birth in stylized combat on the mic, the turntable, the train car, and the dance floor. Uh, the best means folk had available then to de-escalate the genocidal and suicidal impulses at work in the scufflingness of New York's and Los Angeles' black and Latino hoods. Uh, in the beginning, hip hop operated from such a radical social position relative to mainstream America as to not even need a message to be an oppositional team. The blackout of black rage in mainstream media made it so. Uh, now, the story of hip hop music getting hung by its own commodified petard after being willfully assimilated by the Borg is almost too much of a cliche to repeat here. But let's also recognize that resistance in music is not always pro forma or easily, easily reduced to literal influence. It remains in the nature of both pop music and the progressive beast mode that the music which soothes the most savage breasts or excites the most rebel heartstrings is not always that speaking the language of direct protest. The fluidity and adaptability of black codes from the underground uh, prevail. Or as George Clinton once said, funk means if you're in Chinatown, you learn to like China, Chinese food real fast. So we know that uh, the, black party for, the Black Panther Party for Self Defense's 10 point platform was composed by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale while spending a weekend binging on Bob Dylan's Ballad of a Thin Man. Dylan's Blowing in the Wind is the acknowledged inspiration for Sam Cooke's Change is Gonna Come and Otis Redding's Sitting on the Dock in the Bay, and as much an in inspiration for Stevie Wonder as Bach, Ellington, Mozart, Coltrane, and the Beatles, and this holds true for Bob Marley as well. Uh, we also know the Golden Laurel Canyon pollen of Joni Mitchell's lyrical stardust worked as magic on a diverse country of radical black music 
uh, makers as Hendrix, Eugene McDaniels, Terry Collier, Prince Seal, Cassandra Wilson, Tracy Chapman. Uh, we also know that Al Green and the Dale Phonics were the favorite singers of the OGs who founded LA's first chapters of the Bloods and the Crips. Uh, Jay-Z is reportedly as much a fan as a student of Journey and Foreigner. Chuck D may cite Coltrane as his man in jazz, but Highland Wolf and Jimmy Reed are the cast to really get his blood going. Now, according to Dream Hampton, Biggie Small's favorite form of laugh along entertainment was not Dolomite or Petey Wheatstraw, but the comedies of Danny Kaye. Wu-Tang's Method Man was a lacrosse champ in high school and an avid collector of Marvel Comics, most morally conflicted anti-hero, the Silver Surfer. Mob Deep's Prodigy and Havoc were once ballet students who probably wore tutus, and like many of these MC I've met, um, were the kids who got straight A's in English comp until cops and robbers in that streetlight came knocking. When I asked Ice Cube back in the 80s if he'd ever been in a game, he replied nearly in shock, hell no, Pops wasn't having it. Thus came about <laughs> Cube's pre-NWA degree in architectural drafting from a Phoenix Technical University. Uh, Kanye West being Kanye West, bro took MC nerdiness to even greater extremes as a youth. At age 10, Yeezy's mother took him to Nanjing University in China, where she was teaching for an exchange program. According to the late Mama West, Kanye was the only foreigner in his class, but settled in well and qu quickly picked up the language, although he has since forgotten most of it. Funk means when you're in Chinatown, you learn to write Chinese. <laughs> um, in 30 years of interviewing um, uh, MCs and producers, uh, has taught me, if, if 30 years of interviewing MCs and producers has taught me nothing, it's a great hip hop MCs are the biggest closet nerds on the planet. Like all <laughs> pop songwriters worth their salt and vinegar, uh, they are masters when they're knowing how to corset and girdle all their brain power for sound biteable mass consumption. We'll assume everybody here transition moment here. Uh, we'll assume everyone here knows about what's been happening in the predominantly black St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri, the justice movement that arose in the wake of unarmed 17-year-old Mike Brown's killing by Darren Wilson on August 9th. Big Mike, as he was known to friends and family, uh, was a young man whose plan was to begin attending his technical college of choice, Vatterock College, on August 11th, uh, to begin studying um, HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning trade. Uh, attention has been paid to the inordinate and excessive amount of hours Brown's body lay in the street until his distraught father was finally allowed to cover it. Attention was also paid to the disinformation smear campaign attempted by Ferguson police when they knew he was falsely accused by a convenience store patron of robbery when the store owners themselves reported no such thing. Uh, the weeks of civil unrest that immediately followed uh, Big Mike's death inadvertently also served to put all of America's local police forces on blast for the massive Volusia-ready armament they've been acquiring through uh, the Pentagon's Weapons Registri Redistribution Program, a program which has even offered rocket grenade launchers and eight-ton armored trucks to university campus police forces. In the immediate wake of Ferguson's self-sparking hands-up, don't shoot mobilization, it wasn't hard to note the voices who were and were not, and were, who were and were not present in support on the local stage. Uh, they won't be our primary fo focus tonight, though, uh, as we call an audible on ourselves um, in favor of those who did speak up. Those are uh, certainly more deserving of uh, the platform and the ac accolades. Uh, so let's first give praise to Killer Mike for the response posted on his Instagram account a week after Mike Brown's murder. Quote, we are human beings. We deserve to be buried by our children, not the other way around. Now, no matter how you felt about black people, look at this mother, look at this father, and tell me as a human being how you cannot feel empathy for them. How can you not feel sympathy for their pain and loss? These are not thoughts, niggas, niggas, hoes, ballers, divas. These two people are parents. They are humans that produce a child and love that child. And that child was slaughtered like game and left face down as public spectacle while his blood drained down the street. St. Louis's own Nelly and uh, T.I. as well weighed in early, even if they did sound more timid than Go Slow William Faulkner during his Nobel Prize speech. All the same, TMZ reports that Nelly plans to initiate a scholarship fund in the name of the murdered youth. TMZ all let us, also let us know that besides the country's grammar rapper, T.I., Kevin Hart, and Al Jefferson will, will, will reportedly be the first to pledge $15,000 a year in college tuition to teens chosen by the Brown family. Lauren Hill also presented a song for Ferguson in the form of a demo of an older track called Black Rage. Uh, more spectacularly, uh, Talib Kweli put his own 10 books 
Tim Boots on the Ground, and in Don Lemon's Gluteus on Air. Uh, musically <laughs> speaking, we can't praise J. Cole enough, who has produced the mu movement's first real dirge, an incredibly emotive and moving B3. Uh, what came and went far too quickly, perhaps, was Don't Shoot, a large group collab organized within a few weeks after Mike Brown's death by the game um, that also featured Diddy, 2 Chains, Rick Ross, Fabulous, Wale, DJ Khaled, Swiss Beats, Yo Gotti, Currency, Problem, King Farrell, and TGT, Who Lays the Hook. Game told Rolling Stone, I'm a black man with kids of my own that I love more than anything, and I cannot fathom a horrific tragedy like Michael Brown's happening to them. This possibility is shaking me to my core. Uh, now, though it racked up a half a million, or has racked up half a million YouTube hits, uh, the vociferous commentary about that particular group of rapidists on that on um, that YouTube page is even more peaked, if not more poignant, than the song. Um, and I love uh, uh, YouTube hip hop threads because they're just always they're more live than the songs, <laughs> you know, and just more um, just unabashed and just real talk. Um, Ryan Cole too wrote. This is the wrong lineup for this song. Absolute worst possible. Dudes who on a regular day promote destructive lifestyles that they didn't live. Game and Officer Ricky. But now they're on some we want justice shit. Then Puffy shows up to give Sirac a plug. Seriously, this is bullshit. <laughs> the Mega Slayer 1, the Mega Slayer X1 replied, riffed and replied. Ryan Cole 2, you're just being a bitch ass nigga. You have lost already. Go start a comic war somewhere else if you ever listen to the lyrics. They talk about how to use the drugs and guns for a reason. Maybe it's not in the song, but most of their backstories are there to back up the story of them growing up. And this rap is really serious because Mike Brown was shot down for no reason. And it sends the message that we need to help Ferguson and God needs to save us all from the racism in America. RBG brother writes, about time they use hip hop how it was meant to be used. Hashtag RIP Mike Brown. Online commentators have marked the difference between the muted response from pro athletes and the athletic show of footage displayed by LeBron James and Dwayne Wade in Miami Heat after Trayvon Martin's murder by George Zimmerman. Uh, rap music celebrity elite triumvirate Jay Z, Kanye West, and Nas though, have produced the most commotion and kaflama in the online community. A brief sampling finds several uh, cats named Anonymous going off. So we said Anonymous won. <laughs> I see a future boycott coming up against artists who fail to look back, give back, and come back to lift up those in time of crisis. Fame for them started in our communities. Did they forget that? No one's asking for money, just time. What does that cost? I would expect more of Jay-Z, but Kanye sold out long ago. He appears soulless and thinks he's immortal, and for that he has absolutely nothing to give back. Quadruple exclamation points. <laughs> Anonymous too. Ain't nobody boycotting nothing. As soon as that new music and the web articles pop up, people will flock with their short memories and thirst to be accepted. People got that HBO special circled on their calendar. Sniff reality. What good does discussion do? Is Nas' discussion going to bring that boy back to life? You can't force people to speak, and if it's not 100% from the heart, why would you want them to speak on Ferguson? It's, up, it's not up to them to speak on it. Not surprised Lil Wayne, Jay-Z, and Kanye Kardashian have been silent. <laughs> this is from not impressed. <laughs> not impressed, right? I don't understand what, what they're expecting to do. They're just rappers. J. Cole and Tick Lee Quali's presence didn't make any difference at all, did it? Killer Mike talking on CNN didn't make a difference, did it? So what's the point? Mike Brown is already dead. Famous walking around the murder scene or complaining on Twitter isn't going to bring him back. I'm not impressed. <laughs> Tropical Cat adds, though, that's like DJ Khalid not addressing Palestine. Some people just don't give a fuck. Andre Downtown. It's a reason why Tupac Shakur, Shakur was the greatest rapper of all time. Tupac would have already addressed this situation, but rappers like Wayne, Jay-Z, and Kanye are built that way. I am, however, surprised that Nas hasn't spoken out. And then we get to Creativity Brown. Creativity Brown is from first. Creativity Brown says, we don't need Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, nor Nelly, or Nas to speak on our city's behalf. The loop, we're gonna ride regardless. STL, the heart of the brave. St. Gaza, the new Watts. RIP Mike Brown, St. Louis, we stand united 314. God is our spokesman, know that. 
So Amy Goodman did an interview with another MC, uh, an MC uh, from Ferguson, Ferguson named Tep Poe, and uh, he was actually on tour um, when he heard about uh, Mike Brown's killing. And he says, yes, I was. I was actually part of the Vatterock College Tour, which ironically enough, Mike Brown was supposed to attend. It's located in St. Louis in the Midwest region. It's a Midwest regional trade school. I was going to help promote the music section of the school on tour. Uh, we went on, I went on one day to the tour. I went to Memphis and I was just, didn't, I just didn't feel right leaving home with all that stuff going on, with so much commotion in the streets. So I just came back and canceled the rest of my dates. In Ferguson, I just got to the ground. To be honest with you, initially, I didn't know what to do. I was a regular person. And I've done some community organizing, among other issues, but nothing so directly attached to the police. And I just got on the ground. And I met Tori Russell, and I met Ashley, and you know other youth organizers. We just kind of formed a united front and moved forward on different issues concerning this one. Ashley Yates. Well, in the first days, I didn't know there was really, I didn't know if there was really a lot of organizing. This was a reactionary where people were just, you know, angry, we were tired, we had seen too many black lives gunned down at the hands of police, so we just looked to the streets to show our resistance to the system that had been working against us, and as the weeks passed, then the organizing really started, and it was pretty much people getting together with the people who had been on the front line and saying, you know, how can we make sure this doesn't happen again, how can we, how can we move forward? And that's why we founded our organization, Millennial Activists United, just to kind of see what these next steps were to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So we focused around a civilian review board at first. We focused around police oversight by the community, whatever that would look like. We focused on removing the people that were in positions of power that had let us down and allowed this tragedy to happen. Uh, the response from the community has been positive. I had a closed session meeting with some of the Ferguson officials. There are definitely people behind that wall that want to make a change, but it's a slow process. It's too slow for the organizers, so we're looking for ways to kind of you know, punch some loopholes in this and make it move a little faster, because we know this cannot happen again, so we want to make sure that whatever change is implemented is expedient. Uh, Tori Russell, well, I was at home actually watching the Little League World Series. It was the Jackie Robinson team was playing. Everybody was tweeting about that. And then on my timeline, I seen a dead body. You know, surprisingly, I didn't react with what, you know, probably you, the way you should react to a dead body. I saw the stepfather. I stay in North St. Louis, like eight minutes away, like my street. I can connect to West Florence and take that right to Canfield Drive. So I sat there for hours. I even saw the sign with Ferguson PD killed my unarmed son. And it took hours for me to actually move. So one of my best friends, Brother Al Sharif from the Nation of Islam, picked me up. We went to the site, saw Brother Shahid, the family, you know, other people were telling me that the father actually took a sheet out to the body because the body was uncovered. And the policeman allowed that. So I didn't know what to do, you know, but I went to the police department to try to get some answers. So I wouldn't say I was a born organizer, but I took people there. I tweeted it out, people followed. It started with one lady named Latoya Cash, Brother Montague Simmons from the Organization for Black Struggle, which I didn't know at all at the time. It was just us eight people, and then it grew to about 100. So we went, in, we went in, you know, tried to talk to Chief Jackson. He said he would meet us, then he drove off. Uh, Mir Baraka wants the black popular music was at any given moment the most exact emotional register of where black America was. Uh, Ferguson uh, has reminded us that in this tradition, basically on word, sound, power. The sound of music, the sound of resistance can take many testimonial spirit catching forms. Dead Prez already told us that Ferguson was bigger than commercial hip hop. <clears throat> and it's also taught us that the bigger they are, the harder they clam up. Uh, whereby any, in this time where by any means necessary, somehow get, got distorted in a trendy new vernacular by any mean necessary. And Miss West Buttocks is the loudest popcorn hit of the year anyway. Justice for Mike Brown, we would crawl. Uh, but Justice for Mike Brown also makes me recall how all our black poetic and liberation theology traditions actually speak more prophetically and profoundly to this moment's mass mobilization anyway. The Claude McKay of If We Must Die, the Gil Scott Heron who said of Johannesburg, I hate it when the blood starts flowing, but I love to see resistance showing and growing. The MLK and his emphatic warning to America I contend that the cry of black power is at bottom a reaction to the reluctance of white power to make the kind of changes necessary to make justice a reality for the Negro. I think we've got to see that a riot is, a, is the language of the unheard. But in the case of uh, Ferguson, hands up, don't shoot justice for Mike Brown, we've seen a script flip as this riot silenced the language of the most heard, America's most heard, most engaged in exploiting modern black cultural capital 
and the glamour and power of black charismatic culture in our time. The poet Michael Harper once wrote that nightmares begin responsibility, and their poem break clusters, so here Hamad cautions us, do not fear what is blown up if you must fear the unexploded. In this, she echoes the 1925 Langston Hughes who said, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore in your rum? Does it stink like rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? I think also of uh, the 1947 Margaret Walker, who wrote, for my people everywhere singing their slave songs repeatedly, their dirges and their ditties and their blues and jubilees, praying their prayers nightly to an unknown God, bending their knees humbly to an unseen power, for the boys and girls who grew in spite of these things to be man and woman, to laugh and dance and sing and play and drink their wine and religion and success, to marry their playmates and bear children and then die of consumption and anemia and lynching. Let a new earth rise, let another world be born, let a bloody peace be written in the sky, let a second generation full of courage issue forth, let a people loving freedom come to grow, let a beauty full of healing and strength of final clinching be the pulsing in our spirits and our blood, let the martial songs be written, let the dirges disappear, let a race of men and women now rise and take control. So if I was ever to meet Creativity Brown, I would say, no, Nas, Jay, and Yeezy, they may not be with you, but Michael, uh, Margaret, Gil, Ramirez, Sterling Brown, Uno K will always be down with the new gods of the new Watts, St. Gods of the new Watts, whenever and wherever they erupt again on the American scene. Um, in closing, I'd just like to give out a cosmic sayonara shout out to the Sugar Hill Gang's uh, Big Bang Hank uh, and the Bang Bang Boogie he lived to see jump up into the fiery lingo of the unheard this time dropped, thereby resetting hip hop's radical opposition of clock, clock, and no, it don't stop. gives a sense of the contribution and the continuity of, uh, of uh, counsel that's going on now between the Freedom Riders and Ferguson. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if anybody has uh, any questions or comments, just feel free. Um, I don't know if we have a mic, probably one, because I, I know sound is kind of lost in this room. So. So yeah, just Sorry, um, yeah. Just <laughs> yeah. Unless you know, unless you, unless you know you're loud, you know. Um, come and rock the mic. Or not. I mean, one thing I know, um, and I know this is true in 
uh, Trayvon Martin's case because you're dealing with the narrative, a narrative that media finds empathetic and grieving parents um, in, the, in both of those cases uh, were uh, especially emphatic grieving parents combined with uh, the uprising, that took, sustained uprising that took place in the street is what sustained that narrative and that story. You know, I mean, um, if you're on my side of uh, black Facebook, all of these um, stories are uh, kind of remain in circulation or reference um, by folks. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, what happens in the, in the mainstream media is what is going to happen in the mainstream media. Spirit. Also, as I said, you know, I mean, it's um, drawn in the council of people who were on the ground, you know, um, uh, Mississippi, you know, um, on those buses, you know, with John Lewis. So, um, you know, and um, I kind of feel like, you know, I try not to talk about Jay Z the same way I try not as a jazz fan to talk about Wooden Marcellus. <laughs> you know, um, not, I mean, not out of disrespect for them, but I just feel like um, they they just become like the easy targets, kind of the whipping the whipping persons, you know, um, for folks that have have a particular grievance about you know the way the way things have turned out. You know, I mean, they you know they they kind of represent um, a certain model of success within mainstream. America um, that doesn't really speak to, um, uh, or does doesn't really recognize kind of the most radical of the folks who came before them to kind of really produce uh, the platform for them to exist, you know. But um, you know, there's just other work to be done, you know. I mean, it's just a, you know, it just becomes like a circle jerk after a while. <laughs> no, no offense. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know about those kinds of on the ground things, but I, but I hope that um, there are people um, engaged in doing oral history projects now, you know, because um, the voices that I've heard from 
in those flashes of the media, um, um, you know, what NPR or CNN or what have you, it's like, um, they're making more sense in the conversation, you know, um, about where, about black America's expectations from America in this point, you know, um, um, and you kind of recognize the two, really the two faces of of um, kind of black the black response, the black American response, historical response, the tradition of response, um, which is um, combative and also, but also optimistic, you know, about the the possibility or the capacity of um, of of this country to actually fulfill, you know. Um, the lofty promises of, of this Constitution and the Bill of Rights towards um, all citizens, you know, um, and I think I don't think anybody um, at this point um, will kind of any sense. Um, I mean, doubts that this is a, a struggle going on on behalf of us all, you know, because um, it just raises uh, so many connected um, issues around around rights and. Um, uh, freedom from um, hyper militarized, you know, police annihilation, you know, um, in whatever community you live. I mean, my, my short answer has, has been for the last few years that um, social media is the new rock and roll. You know? And I think for people like myself, uh, who were 18 in the 70s, like my, my brother back there, you know, um, I mean, I mean, mu music was the equivalent in terms of being the vehicle through which you felt um, your identity was made and was and was most publicly expressed. You know, and um, yeah, I mean, you know that. You know, we're <laughs> we're just living in a different era. Where, you know, where everybody's you know kind of their own rock star. You know, on a daily basis. You know, and I mean, in music. You know, and this is something I've been saying in conversations I've been having with um, folks online about um, Spotify. You know, and uh, music royalties. You know, and you know, you you're at a point. I mean, we're just at a point where it's like a genie's out of a bottle. Um, in terms of what music became, once it became. Uh, digital once it became information, you know, because that's what it is. I mean, music is just part of the same, it's as much, um, or it's been reduced to the state of the YouTube cat video, you know what I mean? It's just, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that for everybody personally, but in the scheme of things, in the scheme of the world, in terms of stability to make noise, um, you know, it's, it's dim, you know, because of, um, you know, kind of all the other kinds of noise that it shares space with. You know, um, so you know, and I, I just all, I just keep that I just keep that in mind from a you know from an anthropological perspective in terms of this, the kind of work we do. You know what I mean? It's like um, uh, Catherine has a friend has a book uh, now called Nostalgia and Apocalypse. I think right? You know, and I was just saying like, yeah, I mean, I I, I operate between those two poles on a daily basis. <laughs> you know what I mean? um, you know, but you know, as somebody who, who who teaches younger people, you know, you're just aware of the fact that um, their cultural surround, their reality matrix, is not one where um, self making is is defined by the the, the oppositional, an oppositionality or radicalism of the musical culture. 
um, you know, um, it's clearly coming from somewhere else. But I mean, the thing that that Ferguson really showed to me was that um, <laughs> the the community, the culture, you know, um, is not dependent on music to know injustice when they see it or to respond to it. You know, um, the fact that you know that for the first time in my life, really, the music is operating at a cultural lag relative uh, to the community is not a deterrent to that community kind of finding its, you know, its language of the unheard. I'm gonna start doing you like my, you guys like my students. I'm just gonna look at y'all and just like. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, start you know, calling people out. Because um, I know Greg won't say it, I'll just interject. Um, you should follow them on Facebook. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you should follow my mother on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Because if you're She's tired of, of this is the cereal I had for breakfast, or man, I'm tired getting this tenure stuff together. Um, <laughs> you want to be inspired daily, hourly, and you're on Facebook guiltily, then you should be creating your papers and getting your business and your stuff together. Like, this is, if you're going to spend waste time doing something, do it's not wasting time. Okay, Kevin, you got the job. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you on the stage. I'll see you on the stage of uh, the Apollo mission. <laughs> I'm actually going to respond to that anecdotally. Um, a friend of mine was in Amsterdam a few years ago, and he uh, is a poet, a uh, poet, musician. Um, and um, he was doing a residency, and he decided, uh, and I can't remember why he decided this, but he wanted to do interviews with uh, people who were deaf in Amsterdam. And one of the people he interviewed said to him, um, or signed to him as an interpreter, he said, um, he said, he said, yeah, this is a good time, he said, for people like me. He said, because uh, your world is becoming more like mine. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I feel like that's a, that's a tricky question, you know. Um, and again, I'll, <laughs> I mean, the first thing it actually makes me think about is um, some of you might have read that, um, that um, Mike Brown's mom is facing felony charges because uh, she basically found out that her, her ex-mother-in-law was selling merchandise related to justice to justice for Mike Brown and she kind of broke that up, you know. Um, so one response I could, you know, when I look at a situation like that, of that response, I just say, well, in the case of this particular struggle, not yet. It's not that time. Um, but again, the thing, I mean, one of the things though, um, 
that you have you cannot be conscious of if you study uh, the movements of the '60s is just how hyper media savvy the people who led those movements were. Like, you know, they kind of understood they understood the medium better than the people who were working in it then. You know, it wasn't until you know those people actually moved into doing um, entertainment and and you know, or that generation of people from that generation started doing things like Saturday Night Live, that you know, you realize that there was this critique of the falseness, you know, or um, the fatuousness, or um, the uh, the blindness of media to itself, you know. Um, but you know, you when you look at like those first interviews of people, um, you know, uh, like Malcolm X, you know, I mean, like MLK. Like, like also like Bob Dylan and, and the Beatles and, and Jimi Hendrix and Sly Stone. It's like, it's just, it's amazing, and Muhammad Ali. You know, I mean, you look at all these people who actually um, knew how to play games with media in the moment, you know what I mean, and completely kind of take over, you know, the stage or, or, or kind of, um, or disrupt the power setup between the person behind the camera holding the mic and then this person in, in front of it. So. I mean, I think what you're talking about is something, certainly when I look at the Panthers, you know, I mean, right. masters, masters of media, you know, but then, you know, then there's like a, there's a, there's a certain, there's like a, a spiritual component to the, the way in which um, kind of, in the black radical tradition, people have been able to make meaning through media, and by that I mean um, Crisis Magazine, which was the NAACP's journal um, under, you know, founded by you know, Du Bois. Um, it had one of the largest circulation of any black like, publication like in the, in the 20s, and it was even being subscribed to by people who were Ill illiterate and lived in cabins, paper with newspaper in the South because those people knew like what that magazine stood for. You know, so when I say spiritual, I mean, you know, um, almost like a talismanic kind of, kind of way or a power object kind of way, you know. So I think that there's a way in which um, the way people use the media that was at their disposal in the past was also effective of, at speaking um, um, without necessarily using a whole lot of words, you know what I mean. Without necessarily calling it branding, yeah. you know what I mean. Um, but branding they, yeah, 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 yeah. But I, but I mean, I, I think it's the equivalent. I think they, they, it was like they were very aware that um, um, the way in which they um, designed and distributed the message, you know, um, you know, they kind of instantly assimilated Madison Avenue techniques and created the Black Panther paper, you know what I mean? So, um, but those, I, like, everybody in black America knew what the Panthers were about on a weekly basis, even if you had no Panther chapter, you know? Um, and it just, it just kind of, uh, you know, it just speaks to the way in which that thing you're talking about um, uh, has already occurred, but it, it happened in a, in a way that didn't leave itself open to the same kind of compromise, I think, that um, just even that choice of language kind of, kind of leads you open to now. It's like, good dog. Um, really quickly, um, you were kind of just talking really loud. Really loud, okay. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about what you said about social media being the new rock and roll, and you mentioned black Facebook, and so, and you just sort of set up the Panthers and how they were able to manipulate media for, for their agenda. So um, that obviously made me think about black Twitter and its um, ability to sort of take, I remember particularly black which- Black women's Twitter. I mean, black women's <laughs> Twitter, for real, for real. And, and thinking about um, Mike Brown, but you know, also um, it, I think it really came into form with Trayvon Martin with mm -hmm. the story wasn't a national story until black Twitter makes it an international story. Yeah. And so I was just wondering if you could give us your thoughts on, on black Twitter's ability to sort of 
um, present counter narratives to mainstream media and to take mainstream media to task for uh, and, 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 and issue swift and, and um, um, virulent takedowns when necessary. So. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll, I'll just out myself and say, uh, you know, I, I only know that from uh, from reading the paper. Because you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I don't I don't have a Twitter account. Uh, never send a send a tweet, and uh, I and I realize it's just because um, I think for some of us there's a you know there's a, there's a kind of general generational cutoff. So I ability to participate in all. Yeah, so yeah, so I can only go as far as Facebook. That's as far as I can go. I mean, I mean, I have friends like you know my friend Dream Hampton. Um, when she got you know when she got on Facebook, I was just like, oh, this is perfect for you. It's like Dream Hampton at the speed of thought. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you know, because she's literally somebody that has like she really has like two thousand things to say to the world. All the time. Yeah, all the time. yeah, and it's like stuff you want to read, think about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I think as we saw with you know the Arab African Spring, you know, I mean, you know, um, you get to see these kind of behind the looking glass um, versions of this media that, you know, that most people see as just communicating like trivia, you know, trivia like all day. And then you see like, oh, no, I mean, this could really be mobilized. This could be a way of kind of mobilizing the whole nation and code to, you know, kind of confront power. You know, so, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, it's just like same thing, you know, famous line people say about, um, you know, a knife in the hands of a murderer or in the hands of a surgeon. You know, um, you know these, you know these tools, the capacity for using them in these very nuanced, um, powerful, uh, provocative ways um, are—they're kind of ever ready. You know, um, and they just—you know—they're just awaiting that. You know, that that kind of uh, that uh, that 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 spark of of um, of uh, desire. Uh, upset the apple cart. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Yes. Um, I just wanted to comment about the whole idea about branding. Can everyone hear me? A uh, comment about the whole idea about branding. Or if you can oh, yeah, just yeah, grab it. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I wanted to talk about um, about branding and um, it brought to mind about what the Dream Defenders in Florida are doing, especially with the Voter Vest yeah. um, campaign, and that was just brilliant. Um, a commercial about you know buy a uh, child proof um, yes. uh, bulletproof vest yes. for your child. Yes. If not, you know go out and vote on um, sales. On <laughs> sales, yeah. And then you can go to their website, and it was like a fake um, online shopping cart saying like buy a bulletproof vest, and you know yep. the type of stuff that they've done on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and I mean, it's interesting because I, because I, one of the things I think that um, you know. It's like if you, you know, again, it's like if you study the history of, of oppositional movements, you you realize like, well, these are, I mean, movement is an art form, too. You know, I mean, it's it's a creative medium, uh, as much as anything that we consider under the kind of formal disciplines. And you know, I mean, it's one of the things that I, that I mean, you know, like you can, you know, a friend of mine got in, got into trouble like a few years ago when he told somebody who was very, um, you know, was uh, had been a teenage devotee of the Black Panthers that, you know, um, he thought the Panthers were like a great performance art group, you know what I mean? But, I mean, move, you know, like, public struggle is performance, you know what I mean? There's no, there's no denying that. And, you know, there, there are actors in that that we find charismatic and glamorous, you know what I mean? And, um, um, and, that, and their potency is based on being able to use, you know, that, that, um, that public platform in these incredibly ingenious and aesthetic kinds of ways. So I mean I think it's one of the under acknowledged attributes of, you know, what we call like, you know, radical radical structure. Um, I there's other media 